we're going to start with a few short presentations from uh, the three people I'm about to introduce, um, looking at the profession and value of data science. We'll show you a day in the life of a data scientist and hope to give you an understanding of why this profession is the next great profession for certification by the Open Group. So I'm going to introduce all three speakers um, at once to keep the flow going. Um, but um, <clears throat> in order of their, of their presentation, Martin Fleming is IBM's Chief Analytics Officer and Chief Economist. The Chief Analytics Office is a data science center of competency focused on improving business performance and achieving financial goals. As Chief Analytics Officer, Martin leads IBM's initiative to become a premier cognitive enterprise. Next up, we'll hear from George Stark, who's an IBM Distinguished Engineer, Statistics and Quality. George applies statistical techniques, simulation modeling, and standards assessment to achieve improvements in productivity, cycle time, and quality for software development and IT infrastructure operations. And third, last but by no means least, Maureen Norton, Distinguished Market Intelligence Professional in the Chief Analytics Office at IBM. Maureen is also currently the IBM Global Data Scientist, data scientist Profession Lead, helping to grow the skills and expertise of data scientists. So uh, you'll hear from them one, uh, one after the other. Um, please send your questions in along the way in real time, and then we'll get to those questions with a panel session um, after the third speaker. So first up, please, a warm welcome for Martin Fleming. You know, it's, uh, it turns out to be not very often that uh, new occupations on new professions are created. Uh, let me draw on my uh, role as chief economist for a minute and, and say that as we look at occupations, the growth of occupations over the years, there are relatively few that appear and relatively few that disappear. The joke among economists is the only occupation that's ever disappeared is elevator operators. Uh, it turns out not to be quite true because if you're ever in uh, any of the House and Senate office buildings in Washington, you'll notice that they still have elevator operators, which is probably more a commentary on members of the House and the Senate than, uh, than anything else. Um, but nonetheless, this is an occasion to recognize and celebrate the creation of a new role, a new occupation, and a new certification category. So why is this important? Why do we want to take a moment to recognize this? First of all, the, the data, the analytics tools, and the technical infrastructure that we have available to us currently allows us to not only measure but also to be able to anticipate events and performance of our organizations in a much deeper, more meaningful, and systematic way. It's not much of an exaggeration to say that historically it's been the case that much of the performance analytics that occurs is really focused in the financial sphere, largely drawing on the, the, the information and the data contained typically uh, in an income statement, looking at ledger-based data. That certainly is helpful, but it only gets us so far. What we've learned today is that there are other sources of data that previously have been either looked at independently, think of CRM data with sales, opportunity and client data, ERP data on supply chain, human resource data. But now we're in a position to be able to integrate those data sets, to be able to take a more holistic view and understand in a deeper way the performance of our organizations, good or bad, and be able to come closer to be able to answer the question, why? Why are we seeing the performance that we're seeing? Why are the results the way they are? And what are the actions to, that can be taken to improve performance? That, that, those causal uh, inference discussions are among the most challenging um, that we have. But nonetheless, 
we're, we're, in, we're playing with a much, a much better hand. Secondly, of course, uh, with the advent of machine learning and artificial intelligence capabilities, the ability to anticipate or predict not only organizational financial performance, but the performance of all of us as individuals, the, the anticipate the kind of needs that clients have through the use of recommendation engines, um, and the ability to understand or predict where there are opportunities to partner uh, in an ecosystem are all examples of places where machine learning and artificial intelligence are helping us to improve uh, the, the performance of our organizations. There are, of course, very significant workforce implications. Talent and skill is receiving a much greater focus. Certainly, if you talk to any business leader, any CEO, talent uh, is at the top of the agenda. Could certainly, you could argue it always has been, but certainly with much greater intensity uh, these days. So given the kinds of vast volumes of unstructured data, the larger bodies of structured data that we can now integrate, the kinds of capability that, uh, that the cloud infrastructure provides, whether it's a public cloud or a hybrid structure or a private cloud, all of these capabilities are moving us well beyond where we have been in the past in terms of being able to create business value. And that's where the role of the, the data scientists come in. It's a little bit of an anomaly to have the term science or scientist in the title because much of what we're focused on here is creating business value as opposed to simply performing science. But that's the challenge of the role. Be able to bring the business insight and the business acumen with the, the talent uh, uh, that the scientific training and scientific practices uh, bring to us. Secondly, given the importance of the insight, the measurement, and the, the, the value that's being created, the role of ethics and integrity play a significant role. It's incumbent upon all of us who are in these roles to be able to present the insight, the recommendations, in an honest and unbiased and, and fair and impartial way. Much as we have come to rely upon other institutions, whether it be auditing firms or financial teams within organizations, data scientists are now in a position where there's a similar expectation around the, around the integrity and the honesty of the insights and the data that are being created and being presented. Uh, Obviously, there are pr pressures from time to time to present the results in one fashion or another, um, and, that's, and that's where the, the challenge arises. So as we go forward in building this new capability, both as a profession um, and as a certification program, the issue of, of ethics becomes an important one. It's not only within our, our own organizations, but there are larger public policy implications and public uh, uh, implications as well. As you may know, this is a controversial topic in the facial recognition space. Uh, we as an organization have been subject to, to some of the criticism. I'm pleased to say we've been able to respond rather quickly. But the folks at the, the Media Lab at MIT have been particularly active in making the point around being able to recognize both genders, all races, various ethnic groups, and not having the data driving uh, everybody to be recognized as a, as a white male. Just another example of where uh, ethics is playing a role from a data science perspective. Um, and thirdly, because of the significance of the role that we play, security and cybersecurity become extremely important the ability to be able to generate meaningful results, which in some instances in a privately held firm can have implications for equity value in the, in the uh, financial markets. Security, privacy, confidentiality become very important. And, and being able to create means by which 
uh, such insights and such information can be protected uh, is important. Likewise, we all are dealing with vast bodies of human resource data. And in some instances, personal information. Uh, and it, that becomes another place where, where things can go wrong uh, and damage can be done. Um, of course, as we know, governments uh, are increasingly paying close attention uh, to the issue of privacy and security. A lot, of, a lot of the focus, as we know, has started uh, in the European Union with GDPR, but this is uh, a concern and a movement that's rapidly spreading, uh, not only to throughout Europe, but Japan, the Japanese government, has taken um, a great deal of focus. And increasingly, we're seeing this issue here in the US as well, although perhaps uh, lagging a little bit some of, some of the other nations. But believe me, it's, it's coming along. So security becomes uh, an important issue. So I just offer these, uh, these uh, suggestions uh, in the context of the, the launch of the, the data science certification program uh, in the data science profession. Uh, where we've been pleased to, uh, to be a part of this. And we appreciate Steve and, and his team's involvement um, in all of this. And, and hopefully, we'll, we'll get all of you uh, engaged uh, in one fashion or another in the certification. So with that, let me uh, turn the floor over to George. Thank you, Martin. I appreciate that. Uh, I'm going to use slides. <laughs> so it's, let's see. So Martin talked about the key issues that face us on a, I'll call it a model by model basis. Um, these are things that we have to evaluate and have to take into account in everything we do. And what I'm going to tell you about is what my day involves as a data scientist at IBM. So. Basically, this is a view of my calendar uh, from February 15th. And so you can see that I start at 6 in the morning and basically go till 5 at night. And throughout the day, I'm doing basically the six steps that are the data science process in various forms and, and, uh, and techniques. I'm going to spend time early in the morning doing a peer review of a data science model that's been developed by our team in India. And that'll involve me asking the questions that, that Martin just talked about. What was your training set size? How, was it, how did you make sure it wasn't biased? What are we doing with security? How did we handle uh, GDPR? And did we make sure we encrypted all the, the possible data uh, sources? How did we understand the data sources? How did we build the model? What does the model look like? What does the model say? How did you validate the model? These are all the things we do during a peer review. And then we ask, OK, if we use this, what do we expect the business results to be? And so the real key here is that a data scientist is really a unique combination of a business acumen, computer science, math, statistic, economics. And it's really combining those three areas into a single role that helps the business. So my day consists, as you see, mostly meetings, lots and lots of meetings. We have meetings to talk about what are the data sources. And we have to go interview the experts on each one of those data sources. Martin mentioned the ERP systems, the HR systems, the financial systems, also the operational systems. Uh, you know, how many incidents are coming in? How many customer complaints? What's in those customer complaints? Uh, we also look at the business problem. So yesterday I had a meeting with one of our clients, and the, the client spent some time explaining to me his business problem. And I asked some questions. And I said, well, you know, we have these options and these options. And uh, then we went around another time. We iterate on the business problem roughly 20 times until we arrive at a document. 
And the document is really one sentence that describes the business problem from that particular person's point of view. So what we say is, what's your role in the business? What direction do we need to move your KPIs? What, what are the, what's the key KPI that we're after? Is it we want to uh, reduce the effort in the process? Do we want to increase the quality of the process? Do we want to increase productivity? Do we want to uh, increase profitability? What's the target variable after? What's the scope of the problem? Is it one group? Is it one location? Is it uh, multiple product lines? What are we talking about? And then how much do we expect to see in what period of time? So as we iterate on the discussion of the business problem, we end up boiling it down to this very straightforward document that says, you know, as a CIO, I would like to increase the availability of the mid-range server environment by 5,000 hours over the next six months. Now we have a well-formed problem that we can go out and collect data, analyze it, clean it up, build a model, do some simulations, and predict an outcome, and say, if you take these actions, we believe we can achieve this business goal that you've defined based on this model. So, you know, the, the next step is to collect some data. You have to figure out all of the disparate systems that you're getting data from, and you have to make sure that those data sets match. They have to match in timing. They have to match in units. They have to match in locations. Uh, one of the interesting things that I see all the time is people pulling data from disparate systems with timestamps. And the timestamps will be in European time. They'll be in uh, US Eastern time. They'll be in US Pacific time. And the data scientist will forget to transform them all to a common time frame. And the model will be not good. So time is, is an important variable in almost everything we do. And making sure that it's consistent across your data set is key. Uh, another one that's really become uh, interesting in just the last, what, four or five years is geospatial data and weather data. We now have incredible access to the geospatial data and the weather data on your phone, on uh, the, the internet, and in databases that are publicly available. And including that data in your models really uh, ups the viability and the utility of them for making predictions. We did uh, one analysis for a bank in Brazil, helping them figure out when to stock their ATM machines based on weather predictions and, and festival predictions and things we got off uh, the internet, mapping that with their locations of their ATM machines. Uh, and that was a really cool project and a lot of fun. And it helped the bank save a lot of money because we could predict when the best time to stock their ATM machines were and which ATMs were going to need how much money when. Uh, the, the next step is really understanding the data. And the best way to understand data is to visualize it. And, and we literally make hundreds of visualizations for every project, looking at the different data sources and, and the different um, well, skewness and kurtosis. So you know how big are their tails, and, and what are all the data sets, and where might we find outliers that would drive different things. And so you have to do this on the individual data items, and you have to do this on your model results as well to do these visualizations. Uh, you look for different transformations. The tried and true transformations of log and square root are still good. They still do their job of reducing variation in your data set, and uh, you have to use them. Key is you can't ignore zero values, right? If your data set has a lot of zeros, you have to be very careful that blanks and missing values don't get treated as zeros when you're doing your modeling. You have to uh, take all that into account. So 
the next thing you have to do is actually build a model. And this is you know, where the computer science part comes in. You have to code generally in Python or R. We use a lot of SPSS. Uh, SPSS, very cool product, been around for 50 years, does, does the modeling very well. And you know, basically there's three or four kinds of models. There's classification models where you take in a lot of unstructured data, classify it into groups, then use those classes in order to build a forecasting model. Or you'll segment your data set uh, into similar uh, groups. We, in my organization, tend to look at IT environments and try to measure the similarity among IT environments to figure out what kinds of actions to take. Um, these are all the base, but then you also have to answer the what if. And the what if comes from Monte Carlo simulation or discrete event simulation that's put on top of these models that you're building so that you can play with the parameters and look for the future. You have to validate the model. Uh, generally, we talk in terms of precision recall and F1 score, where we're trying to understand what the accuracy and how well our predictions uh, are. In the, in the example that I have on this slide, we're looking at problematic servers in an environment, and we want to know, uh, obviously, how many that we, we got right and how many we got wrong when we classified them as problematic or non-problematic. Probably the hardest part for most data scientists is building the story. And this is where the business acumen really takes hold. And you're able to take someone from start to finish and explain, OK, this was the business problem we agreed on. Here's the result. Here's the actions we recommend. And if you care, I'll walk you through all the technical details of the model. Most of the time, they don't care. So the rules we have, be brief, be blunt, be gone. Just give them, the, give them the results, tell them why the results make sense, and if they want the details, we'll go into it. But you really need to tailor your message for your audience. Uh, if you're presenting to architects or data scientists, they're going to want all those details, and you have to be able to explain it to them. Managers are pretty much interested in the bottom line, what do I have to do now, and what do I have to do in the future? And executives are interested in how much money am I going to make, how much am I going to save, what business strategy do I need to make? So uh, depending on your audience, the, the presentation, the story you build is quite different. So that's the day in the life of a data scientist, and that's going through all of the steps uh, associated with building a model and getting it used in, in your environment. So now I'm going to hand over to Maureen, who's going to talk about the uh, certification. OK, thank you, George. I wanted to just start with, we've been talking about this world of data, and you have no doubt heard so many times that it's exploding, and how we tap into that world of data is really where data scientists can add so much value. I know NASA's here, so uh, this, this visual seemed to make sense. But data scientists, you know, they're, they're really pioneers. They're going places with, you know, big data and dark data and streaming data and all different kinds of ways to really push the boundaries of our knowledge and to gain the insight and value out of that. One of the things that Martin you know, talked about is the value that data scientists can, can bring to an organization. And there's so many different ways that that happens. It can be across the enterprise, whether it's supply chain, finance, uh, not just business enterprises, but nonprofits, and using these kind of skills to tackle all kinds of societal problems as well. So we're so excited to be able to have this opportunity to work with the open group to recognize this profession, which is really at an early stage in terms of making a um, you know, significant impact across the board. 
they can certainly help with a lot of optimization kind of problems that companies and enterprises are dealing with. And most importantly, kind of connecting the dots. When you think about all the data, and George was explaining where, uh, how you have to clean the data and, and connect it and get the timestamps right and all of that. But one of the real values that we've been seeing is that the data scientist, their role is they're going to be connecting data across silos. So you might have people who are working in finance or HR, um, supply chain. Um, and the data scientist with the role, if it's done, you know, done right in the organization, they're able to really see across and connect dots across the silos for a level of insight that can make a significant difference strategically for, for enterprises. And it also helps the data scientists see things from a very different perspective because of that and being able to, you know, literally step back and be able to, uh, to analyze things and draw those insights. So we are today uh, helping the open group with the launch of the data scientist profession. And it is an experience-based certification. So it's not a test that you take and then, you know, earn something, it's, it's based on experience. So that day in the life of the data scientist where you have, you know, somebody who is a practitioner who has been solving business problems uh, with these methodologies is now being recognized uh, by the Open Group, you know, as our newest profession. We've been working on this for the last year, a little over a year, George Stark and I presented to the Open Group Board uh, a year ago at the January conference and made a proposal. Said, you know, we really think this is a profession that we should add as an Open Group uh, certified profession. And we built a business case for it. And uh, they were very enthusiastic and gave us the go ahead to start forming a working group to work with other companies and define what does it really mean to be a data scientist. So, you know, we came with our point of view and the collaborative effort with the open group and all of, you know, the members was phenomenal because it really improved it to make it be not just an IBM view of what is a data scientist, but really an open group, well vetted and argued and debated <laughs> view of what a data scientist should do in terms of being able to uh, meet a certain standard. So, based on that, we're adding the open certified data scientist today. And similar to architects and uh, the tech specialist, there are three levels of certification that are being announced. And uh, the certified level, the master certified, data scientist and the distinguished data scientist. I'm gonna give you a little bit of uh, background here. So the very exciting part is that it is really being done in a stepwise milestone approach. So it's not a certification that you have to work away at for years and then put together a huge package at the end. Uh, this is breaking it down into significant milestones that need to be attained. And then it makes the review process uh, for both the reviewers and the data scientists uh, much better at the end. So a candidate submits a total of five application forms to obtain these milestone badges. And it can be in any order, that really doesn't matter. But one of the first to talk about here is professional communication. We've both, uh, you know, we've heard from Martin and George how important it is to, you know, have that business acumen and be able to really communicate and tell the story. You know, if you've just come up with brilliant insights but you can't communicate that, you can't translate into the right visualization, you're not gonna convince anybody to change what they're doing or change their, their approach. So uh, there are guidelines and, and standards to meet for professional communication. Um, likewise, as most professions, you want people to stay current, to be um, up to date on the latest tools, technologies, and approaches. So professional development is a key part to keep those skills uh, 
fresh. And then kind of the heart and soul, the way I see it is on the certification, this is really built on experience. So this is when you've got you know, data scientist who has worked on a project and if it's the certified level, that means that they you know, may have been supervised by other data scientists, that's the initial level. Um, level two is when the data scientist is really more leading the projects. And then the other, uh, the distinguished data scientist is really kind of the thought leaders and they're having a much broader impact. So that kind of differentiates the levels. And so the experience profiles are, are really the heart and soul of this. This is showing that you have tackled a business problem and, and solved it, and you can demonstrate the value that that brought. Um, these are then reviewed each step of the way by subject matter experts you know, who will determine that it's met the requirements or not. Then after those milestones have been met is when the data scientist can submit a experience application form for certification. And then the final step is in the going to the review board. So the candidate's evaluated with all of that submitted material and uh, gets a uh, decision. The board recommends certification if the majority uh, agree that the candidate has met all of those requirements. So that's a high level overview of the process. It's probably gonna sound pretty familiar to architects and tech specialists. Uh, we took a lot of lessons learned from the other professions that are much more mature and have gone before us. Um, and they've been very generous with, uh, with those uh, lessons learned. So we really tried to uh, design this so that people can get started and one of the key things we really want to do is we look at this as just the beginning. You know, we want to grow this profession. We want to develop the body of knowledge that can be used across the profession and different uh, globally, frankly. We want to also do outreach to universities. So a lot of the universities are now just starting to graduate the first uh, groups that have masters in analytics, data science, artificial intelligence, machine learning, all of these great uh, areas. And uh, they're doing projects, capstone projects, as part of those university programs. And they do it with you know, real data, real clients, solving real problems. So that, that could qualify for one of those project profiles and get them well on their path to becoming certified. So that's one way we look at trying to grow the profession. Um, enterprises. Uh, can become accredited, use all the standards that have been created here and become accredited so that they can run their own program. IBM uh, just recently went through the accreditation process uh, with data science after, uh, after this work and we're thrilled to uh, get that. So we've been building a version of that to do that and process the data scientists within the company. Other companies are welcome to do that and tap into this, this I think, terrific work that's been accomplished here. Um, and now I'm gonna do a little commercial because we, as I said, really wanna grow this profession. We are very interested in a data scientist forum. And so we have a workshop tomorrow afternoon, which you are certainly all invited to. Um, we have a little fun thing to start with, who wants to be a millionaire data scientist game. Um, and then we have Arizona State University, who's located nearby. They've had a couple of those projects that I mentioned, those capstone type projects, with uh, two clients that they're gonna have joined tomorrow, APL Logistics and the Arizona Lottery. And they're gonna talk about that. And then Anna Echeverry is going to take us through the data scientist competency model, which I think people will find really interesting and very useful. So. Uh, with that, I think I will turn it back to you, Steve. Okay, thank you all three for uh, giving us your insights there. Um, we're 
we're obviously uh, we're going to have somebody else join the panel who uh, isn't going to give a presentation, but uh, will be able to add a lot of insight to this, and that's uh, uh, my colleague in the open group, um, James DeRave. So, James, if you could start taking a seat. Um, James is now the uh, VP and general manager for our India operation. Welcome, James. Thank you. Please take a seat. Um, but it has a long history um, of working on certification within the Open Group. In fact, way back to the early pre predating uh, the uh, single unit specification. So uh, a long, long time doing that. And he is the Open Group staff person responsible for the Open Professions Work Group that we have that runs the programs that Maureen showed on her on her chart for the architects and the technical specialists and now the data scientists. So uh, welcome, James. Um, so we have, we have questions coming in on Slido, um, and uh, I'd just like to, to start with, um, with, with not a surprising one from this audience, a um, lot of interest in architecture here. <laughs> um, the question reads, how do you see the role of, uh, of enterprise architect and data scientist merging? I might change that slightly, not my question, but I might change it slightly to do you see that role, um, enterprise architect and data scientist. Is that one that, uh, who feels comfortable to take? Maybe Martin? Sure, I can see you're looking at me to, to, <laughs> to do this. So um, I'm not sure about the merging point, but certainly working very closely together. Um, the the, the uh, advent of uh, much more sophisticated data platforms uh, we think of the Watson data platform. We have a version of that that we've deployed internally. But being able to bring all the disparate data sources together, uh, and George certainly gave examples of, of many of them, but there, you know, of course there are others. Um, and not only to, to do the engineering, which is an important piece of it, but also to do the data governance, uh, which turns out uh, in our experience to be uh, among the the most important and most difficult uh, challenges that we face. So the data engineering becomes important as the cloud architecture begins to become um, increasingly available and sophisticated uh, to have the, the compute, the storage, the access to the APIs uh, all in one location to deal with latency and bandwidth issues is, uh, is a real challenge, but it's something that the data scientists and the and the architects uh, have to be able to come together on. Um, and then also to, to also work together on the issues around governance, one trusted source of data. Um, to be able to be certain that when that, those data are ingested, there are not transformations that are occurring that might, may be creating inconsistencies. Uh, to be able to have the appropriate set of taxonomies so that as, that data are, are, as those data are being viewed, uh, they're being viewed consistently across the organization. Um, so a very significant set of issues where, where both teams have to be able to work really as one. Thank you. We have questions coming in, so unless anyone is desperate to add anything, I'll, uh, <laughs> I'll move on to the, to the next question. Um, have any of you put together applications for the certification program yet? Yes. <laughs> yes, as, as part of uh, building the system for IBM data scientist, yeah. we've created you know, applications right. and I've worked with uh, Christina and other people on the open group to once all the conformance requirements were uh, defined that we could then look at the application process and make sure that we're covering everything that we have deemed a conformance requirement in right. those applications. So. so you've kind of been our guinea pigs. Yes. <laughs> okay. okay, good, good, good. Um, James, maybe one for you. Um, Maureen touched on it in her, in her presentation and, and described it as exciting, which it is, the stepwise um, nature of the certification program, which is a little different to what we have for the other two profession programs. Can you say a bit more about what's different and why? For, for some value of, of exciting for those interested <laughs> in certification, um, it actually is um, beyond that. Uh, it, it's um, for those who are familiar with the programs we've been running for the last several years now um, in in the architecture space. 
Um, there's a big sort of a, a logistics challenge for the individual wanting to get certified because the requirement is that they fill in a form. Okay, sounds okay. But the form ends up being about 55 pages long and can take you know, 40, 50, 60 hours of time to actually complete properly. That's a substantial impediment. Um, you've got to find the time. You've got to find the will, the motivation to actually get that done. And a lot of people do it, um, uh, but it's also, it's a barrier. So one of the things that we were very keen to do in the reworking of our professions uh, program, uh, which we've been able to pilot with the data science profession, is to say, well, how can we partition this into um, more easily digestible, um, more bite-sized pieces? Um, so that's why we said, well, we've got to break it up into milestones. And then the task was, well, how do we do that without in any way compromising the overall quality and integrity of what it means to become certified? So that's what we think we've achieved. We're very confident we've achieved it. Um, so data science has said it's the pioneer program for this approach, um, but we are well down the path of the definition and implementation phases for introducing this into the architect profession and into the technical specialist profession and other professions that we're also working on in parallel. Um, as, as I think you, some of you may remember, uh, Andras Sakul yesterday mentioned um, that the supply chain activity within the uh, Trusted Technology Provider Forum is looking at the, an experience-based program. So that will use the same milestone-based approach. It's what we're going to do for all of our experience-based um, certification programs now. So um, they'll all come out, uh, just uh, hold in there and, and you'll get the benefits. <laughs> That was going to be the second part of my question. If we're doing it for this, shouldn't we be doing it for the others? And uh, you know, so it's it's good to hear it's well underway. Um, George, I know when we last met, um, you uh, gave us a presentation that that um, involved references to things like Moneyball and and other things. I know you've told me that professional sports is one of, or probably the biggest user of uh, a consumer of of the analytic data science and the analytics. Could you say a bit more about that? I mean, it's a, a topic that I know interests a lot of people, but uh, well, yeah, obviously how do they use them? The, the book Moneyball and, and the movie Moneyball introduced data science to the public. And essentially what happened was the Oakland Athletics had a very fixed budget, and they had to figure out how many runs it was going to take to win enough games in order to win their division and get into the playoffs on the budget that they had. Uh, professional baseball has always been very much a, a skills-based and, and a reputation-based industry, but these guys turned it into economics and they turned it into a data science project where they had a goal of, of scoring so many runs in a year to win so many games in order to win their division and they figured out how much money they had and they had to allocate that money to their positions. So how much money are you going to pay a first baseman? How much money are you going to pay a shortstop? And where are they going to hit in the lineup? And that was a, a data science problem and became how now major league sports, baseball, football, in fact, I was telling Maureen that there was an ad uh, just about a month ago for a chief data scientist for the Denver Broncos. You know, they've had two losing seasons in a row. They're struggling at the quarterback position. They're struggling on the offensive line. They're now looking for new ways to apply data science to their budget to, to field a winning football team. And so professional sports has really caught on to the notion of data scientists. Right, thank you. Uh, so, next question. Adding consistent metadata to the data would be beneficial to the data science an analysis effort. The open group ODEF standard should be considered here. Is that something you've taken into account yet or about to? That's certainly something that Maureen and I have talked about yeah. for the workshop mm -hmm. tomorrow in building the community and how to use these resources to grow the community and, and integrate more closely. Right. Yeah, I would also add that uh, metadata is a place where we've struggled quite a bit. Um, a large organization, many disparate and diverse data sources. Um, so any, anything like uh, the kinds of standards uh, that, that you all are helping to create um, can be applied, I think, very productively. 
uh, particularly in, in larger organizations where uh, data just seems to appear out of everywhere and uh, yeah. uh, becomes a, a really management and governance challenge. I think that really is one of the exciting parts about being here and being able to work with you know, the other parts of the open group and you know, to be able to find those synergies and really able to build on them, which I think will help all the professions. Right, so, so as I, I mean, you've talked about the workshop tomorrow and that's, and you've emphasized more and it's, it's, this is the start with the certification yes. program and we need to build on, on that. So um, things like where do the other standards of the open group play, where do the other standards from outside the open group play, and, you know, build a community um, here at the open group, that's what we're all looking for, I think. So. Mm -hmm. Good, good, good. Um, Question about the program itself. Uh, how far back can you go when using experience for the certifications, or does every example have to start from today going forward? I'll, I'll try and remember. Um, it's, I'll, I'll it help is, you. <laughs> excellent. But between the two of us, we'll probably get the right answers. Um, this is an important distinction, I think, between the professions programs and the knowledge-based exam programs. Um, in a, in a, you take a TOGAF or, or a similar um, skills-based um, program which involves training courses, exams, and certificates as a result of passing an exam. Um, yes, it's a statement about the knowledge and understanding that that individual has, but in a sense, it's about what their, um, it's about something new for them. It's about new knowledge. Um, so it's a, it's a forward-looking thing. Um, now. The prof these professions programs based on skills and experience, it's not so much that they look back, but they look at what you have achieved as being the indicator of what you can achieve next. So yes, the program allows, it is all about um, experience you have demonstrated, skills you have demonstrated in projects to achieve results. Um, so yes, we've got time, timeline rules in the program. Um, you must have an experience in the, which is in the last three years in order to get certified and you can't cite anything older than eight years. I think I've got those numbers you do. right. You do. Um, but it, it's, it's really critical that to understand that, that it's based on um, a, a, a clear description and interviews and discussions about what you have done. So it's about proven experience, proven skill, proven ability to deliver results. Mm -hmm. It's eight years, right? I think it's eight years is, the, eight years. is the, the, the length of the window. And um, if you look at the milestones, that milestone approach, one of those experience milestone badges has to be about a project that was completed within the last three years. So it has to be current. Um, you can't just, you can't get data science certification if you gave up practicing five years ago, it won't work. It has to be current. Right, and like architects and tech specialists, there will be a recertification required every three years. And again, that's to make sure that people are continuing as practitioners and keeping their skills uh, current and continuing to drive results? So, a, a very related question. Um, if I'm an aspiring data scientist, um, how do I start working toward my certification? Ah, that's a An great inevitable qu question, I that's think. That's a great it's question. A, yeah, yeah. Well, if uh, you would mm. go directly to the opengroup.org website, which now has the information on how to get started mm -hmm. on the data scientist uh, profession. I guess it would really depend on uh, where they are in that aspiration, right? I mean, if they are, cons if they are somebody that are really just thinking about how do I gain the skills to become a data scientist, mm -hmm. um, there are a lot of university programs now that have uh, instituted masters in analytics or data science. Um, you don't have to go to one of those to become a data scientist. People come at it from, you know, statistics background, economists, um, and, and other ways. What, what I really like about the certification is how you have come to have those skills. It, you're, we don't dictate how you got those skills. This is experience-based, so you could have been really enthusiastic and taken a lot of MOOCs and just been coding because you love it for so long. Mm -hmm. uh, as long as you're you know, solving problems and being able to meet the conformance requirements. It doesn't matter how you came to those skills, but there is a vast array of ways you can do that. Okay. The, yeah. Just to add there, um, Maureen, you mentioned, you mentioned go and look at the documentation on the Open Group site. And, and 
that, that is so important <laughs> because that documentation is the definition of the profession as agreed by the Open Group membership. Um, so you read the conformance requirements. They describe in, in very clear language with rationale as a skill that we believe a data scientist should have. So if you're aspiring to become a data scientist, those descriptions of the skills that you need to be, become a professional data scientist, they define the things that you need to build into your work. They're the things you need to look for in yourself as to whether, you know, do I have this skill? And if I don't have this skill, um, how can I acquire it? Or if I think I have the skill, how can I demonstrate it on my next project? And the other really useful piece is because we split this program up into the milestones, they've got separate application forms. Okay, it's a bit dry. It's an application form from an experienced milestone. You read the questions. They tell you the things that are important from a data science perspective about a data science project. So it's a really good set of signposts to what you need to do, what you need to think about, what skills you need to acquire, develop, enhance, in order to meet the standard of becoming a professional data scientist. One of the other things we did within IBM is we created success profiles and we did some research with some of our most successful data scientists at both the junior and senior level and really took a look at what made them successful. You know, and we found everything from really personal attributes like, you know, just curious, right? These are data scientists and scientists are inherently curious and they, they like to um, explore and, and figure things out, so problem solving kind of skills. And so kind of looking at that, I think, is also a way where people can, can figure out if, if they are suited for it. Right. right. Um, something you've touched on just now, Maureen, but, but um, what kind of backgrounds do you typically see for the data scientists that you have at IBM? So this is, uh, this, we're now into the challenge of uh, recruiting and hiring. Um, so there are a range of challenges um, that we face. Uh, certainly for those at, a, at more of an entry level, let me address the, an entry level first. Um, we, we've had a lot of good success uh, with folks coming out of MBA programs because they have a combination of the analytic skills as well as the business acumen. Um, in and of itself, that's not necessarily enough, um, but it, that certainly is one profile of the kind of folks that we're looking for. Maureen referenced uh, in her remarks, uh, there are now a number of universities that have started master's programs in data science, uh, and I think we've, we just recently hired our first uh, few folks who completed uh, such programs. So they, the university community is beginning to, to help us uh, in that respect. Um, we've also had a uh, very fruitful uh, activity uh, recruiting folks out of PhD programs across a variety of, of different fields. Um, so my favorite example is um, a young woman actually, this, so this will be amazing, a young woman joined us who completed a PhD in astrophysics um, which is a, a unique combination, but she's a brilliant young person uh, and has enormous amount of experience dealing with quite large data sets because of the astrophysics background. So we have a number of, uh, a large number of P folks who have completed, completed PhD programs in economics and sociology and physics and computer science and astrophysics and a number of different fields, um, but we found that to be helpful just because of the the need for the talent and the intensity of the competition. Uh, another place where, where we've looked, um, we started what I think of as a bit of a minor league program and we have, we have, a, summer in, we have a large summer internship program, but one of the uh, groups of interns are rising juniors and undergraduate programs uh, who then over the course of a couple of summers can join us and come along and we've had success adding uh, folks uh, out of undergraduate programs as well. Now, you know, they're, they're younger, so they can do less, but, but nonetheless, it helps to, to keep the team in good balance and be able to have uh, folks um, uh, in, in a number of different areas. From a, from a more experienced and more senior level, uh, certainly there are uh, a large number of folks who have uh, experience in computer science, uh, in, in finance, 
uh, and, and in other fields who over time become knowledgeable about data science and, and all of the kinds of issues and challenges and uh, struggles that we face and, and so they, they in turn uh, grow into, into the profession and into the roles. I um, mean, that, those are also very useful um, uh, sets of experiences to have because much of what we do is uh, around the business side and trying to get uh, organizations to change behavior. So, uh, um, so in any event, that's where we've, where we've had some success. Thank you. Um, this one's probably for you, George, I think. Um, anyone else is welcome to chip in too. What tools do data scientists use in their daily work and how does the data scientist use agile development and methodologies in this profession? So tools are pretty data, you know, personal, but in general it's Python, R, SPSS, SAS. I mean, those are, those are like the big four that, that come to mind. The CRISP-DM process is agile by nature. It's very iterative. The, the things that I had on my slide, business understanding, data understanding, uh, data cleaning, modeling, validation, and, and storytelling, those are the, the steps. But those don't happen in a straight line. Those happen very iteratively, and they happen very quickly uh, with each other. And so that process that the data, science data scientists use is agile. I mean, the milestones, the stories, the hills, the valleys, you know, that's, <laughs> it's very agile. So I think we've, um, we've seen, to uh, complement what George is saying, um, now recently, and we're talking recently within months, uh, certainly within the past year, um, the advent of notebook uh, type tools like Watson Studio uh, and each one, Microsoft, Amazon, you know, all of the vendors have a, uh, some sort of uh, notebook like tool um, that has become increasingly useful to bring together um, the, the SPSS and the, and the Python uh, type uh, capabilities to, to be able to locate the code in one place. From my point of view, somebody has to lead a large team of data scientists it adds to the productivity and, and the, the efficiency of the team where folks don't have to go searching. Uh, now you could use GitHub, or there are other approaches, but it's, but it's one way of keeping the teams organized. Um, so the, the Watson Studio type uh, tools have become very important. Um, also uh, to what George, the point George is making, the Agile method. Um, if you come to our, and everybody's welcome to come and visit us in, in, uh, in our mark, you will see every morning there are teams of folks standing around having their daily stand-ups uh, and going through a very uh, organized approach uh, with, uh, as George says, uh, hills and mountains and, uh, and uh, uh, deliverables and they've got the squads and, and all the rest uh, in the retrospective. So we're, you know, just like a development, a software development team, uh, we, we uh, adhere to a, a, a well-organized uh, agile approach. In our group, we we use cupcake, birthday cake, wedding cake <laughs> as the hills. <laughs> right. Okay. Thank you. Um, through building the certification program and collaborating with others, did Maureen or George learn anything new about the profession of data scientist? <laughs> Tons. We we did. We we learned about all the different perspectives that people had about data science and. I thought the collaborative process was just fantastic to go through because, you know, we thought we had it all figured out, right? And then we started working with, you know, with other companies who brought a, just a different perspective to it. And, um, and then we had, I mean, a lot of debates. I'm trying to think if there was one thing we might have. Well, the, the big thing for me was the distinction between consulting data science and operational data science. And so we spent a lot of time trying to figure out in the profession, when you're a consulting data scientist, basically your final output is a presentation with a set of results and recommendations. Mm -hmm. As opposed to when you're an operational data scientist, your final product is a set of code that you're integrating into 
a legacy system that's helping to make decisions on a regular basis. And so the certification had to cover both kinds of data scientists. And the original one that we did didn't. And so a lot of the debate and discussion was, okay, how do we fit this for both sorts of professional people? I know when we've done these things in the past, what we tend to find is there's very considerable overlap in the perspectives and the, mm -hmm. the way that organizations have their own professions organized, but differences, and if we can kind of pick the, pick the good bits from, from everyone's, then we get a, we get a better program. So. Absolutely, mm -hmm. yeah. You, you can look at the, what you started with and then where you ended after mm -hmm. you have it vetted with so many different people and those perspectives, and it's a much better product after mm -hmm. it goes through that process. Absolutely. Okay, that's great. Um, how can we grow the need for additional data scientists within my organization? How do we make the business case for joining the Open Group Data Scientist Forum and certification? So this was a challenge that we faced a number of years ago. Um, it's probably even to some degree before, before I, I took on the role. Um, but you have to find opportunities to begin a few small initial pilot projects, I might call them, um, to be able to demonstrate some value. Uh, it's the value, you know, you can talk theoretically about data, data scientists, the opportunity to improve performance, but until you really find a business leader who understands and is willing to have enough faith to support a small team to, to go off and launch into a piece of work and to demonstrate where the value is and how that, uh, that set of, uh, the set of analytics is gonna be translated into bus business actions, improvements, and value delivery in terms of improved revenue uh, and profitability. And if it's in a, a governmental organization, other performance metrics. Um, you know, we oftentimes uh, get into discussions, I often get the question, uh, well, it's easy for you guys to do that. You have all this data, or our data are a mess. Well, our data are a mess too. Um, <laughs> and the challenge is to be able to work along parallel paths, be able to bring sufficient data together, to, to be, and to be clever enough to identify a spot where there are data and where there are meaningful business problems that can begin initially to demonstrate some, some real initial value and then build on that success and, and grow over time. Um, I, you know, we've had a couple of conversations with teams that have said, you know, we just went out and literally, we had a conversation, just went out and hired five data scientists, what should I do now? My answer is that's wrong, you just made the fir your first mistake, right? <laughs> first thing is to identify the business problem in the executive who wants it solved. It, it's, a, it's an almost identical answer to an almost identical question that I've asked in events like this about enterprise architecture. Mm -hmm. you know, how do you make the case for enterprise mm -hmm. architecture? Right. And, and it's a very similar answer. Absolutely. You've got to show value early. You've got to um, you know, demonstrate that there's something here. And, yeah, Absolutely. So, yeah. Good. Okay. Um, how many data scientists does IBM have? And is this profession a strategic goal within IBM and its customers? So that's a question that Maureen and I have worked a lot on. Um, it, it hasn't been a profession, so, so the true answer is we don't know. Um, our best estimate is out of a little bit less than, there's a little bit more than 350,000 employees in IBM, it's about 15,000 data scientists is, is the estimate that, that we have. Uh, spread across many different business units, many different geographies, and many, many different um, uh, countries, in many different locations. Um, and yes, it is a very important strategic uh, role and uh, a place where we want to grow uh, our talent and our skill. Okay, thank you. Um, James, do you want to say a little bit more about what makes up the open data science profession standard? I mean, I think Maureen showed a showed a, a build slide, but how would you describe it? Um, the standard itself, um, it's built into um, some fairly clear and obvious sections. We have uh, a section on, on core basic skills. Um, one of the interesting outcomes from our rework and uh, over the last couple of years has been reaching the conclusion that across the technical specialists, the architects, and the data scientists, 
these core basic skills of professionals are the same. Not just similar, they're the same. So we actually, the wording is identical. Um, and those cover the basic um, functionings of a professional, things like the professional communication, for example, um, conflict resolution uh, um, skills. So there's a, there's a whole set of them which we believe are the same for professionals in this industry. Um, then we have, obviously, profession-specific skills, things that are particular to data scientists or to an application developer or to an enterprise architect. Uh, and then we have experience requirements, um, which are also uh, particular to the particular professions because they're focused on the nature of the projects that people undertake within those, uh, uh, within those professions. So they, um, you know, we start with a look at the life cycle. Uh, uh, George is, you know, what, does, what, what does my day look like? Or what does a project look like for a data scientist? What does a project look like for an enterprise architect? So we, we, we describe that and we fit in the, um, in the construction of the application forms um, we fit in the, um, um, the questions about demonstration of those particular skills within the context of a project, of a piece of, of work. So we've sort of structured it to make it a lot easier for an individual to think about um, how they've demonstrated a skill. So if you think about, um, you know, in this instance, a data science project, and you look at the application form for the experience milestones, it'll help you think through what did you do um, it'll ask you what were key decisions that you made. You know, what were they? Uh, you've got to think about what were those key decisions. And the ability to be able to articulate those, describe them, talk about them, is part of the process of, of, of applying. So um, that's kind of the structure of it and, and why we think we've, we've got something really quite useful here. The other point I think that we haven't mentioned, um, uh, Maureen mentioned that uh, IBM has achieved accreditation and is, uh, uh, you know, we've assessed the IBM program, the way it's operated and the way it's constructed, um, so that they can operate that program internally and, and communicate certified people with us um, when they've reached the, the milestones, when, when they've reached the end uh, certification point. Um, and that's something across the whole piece, that's for the specialists and the architects as well, that's available. Um, but if you're thinking as an organization about building a data science profession about in some way regularizing it and in, in sort of building it into your career model, the way your HR thinks about hiring people and developing and promoting them and, and, and getting the best out of them in this space, the material that we published is a best practice mm -hmm. from the industry that's been reviewed by all open group members about what are the important skills and experiences for a data scientist. It's a really useful starting point in, in helping to capture that within your organization. I think it's inevitable that uh, you know, organizations are going to have special additional requirements for what they want to do within their profession, which they can then add to that common corpus. Um, so it's actually a very, very valuable, accessible resource for all of our members and the public. These things are, are published, uh, uh, you know, it's open to, for anyone to fetch and download. Okay, thank you. Um, what's one piece of advice you would give to folks considering a career in data science? Do it. <laughs> if they've got the, uh, the desire and that curiosity and they're quantitatively inclined and like to really solve problems, um, I think as a career path, it's, it's got just so much promise. You know, the technology will continue to evolve and change. You know, so we have certainly machine learning and neural networks and other artificial intelligence technologies. The path looks very exciting. Uh, going forward, so I would I would definitely encourage people who have those kind of core qualities. Um, I think they could be pretty happy in a mm -hmm. career as a data scientist. It, it's interesting. I had a uh, I was uh, had an Uber driver tell me recently that he was he was doing that, but he was also. Um, in a job that uh, wasn't necessarily everything he wanted it to be, but he really had a passion for data science and he thought he that's where he belonged. But when he looked at how to get into it, it was very, very difficult and there were boot camps he could go on, but they were very expensive and he didn't have the money to do those. And, you know, mm. um, and I told him to watch this space for a, uh, a possible way in of, of doing that without that. But, you know, to start with some of the companies that that we're uh, looking, it's a very much in demand um, skill and you never know where you can get in. But I think he was 
it was just one conversation, but it was, it, it was very much a, I don't think I can make that leap without mm. having done something to show I've, I can be a data scientist. And I said, I think you probably, it doesn't matter what your background is or anything, if you demonstrate the right attributes, then you've got a chance. But any, anyone else want to, want to add to what Maureen well, said? Yeah, I, I, I'm going to echo Maureen. Do it. I've been a data scientist for going on 35 years now. And the beauty of it is that I've solved problems for the Department of Defense. I worked at NASA for a while. Uh, I've spent the last 20 years at IBM working with banks, with food service companies, with all sorts of unique industries. And they've all wanted me to help them solve business problems. And that's really cool. Yeah. That you know you don't you're not doing one thing for Real your stuff. entire life, mm -hmm. and and you're meeting all these people across all these industries. It, it's really fun. <laughs> so, uh, so the the other point that I would make and hasn't arisen yet so far in the conversation is ultimately to achieve success from my point of view as somebody that has to lead a, a team. Um, we have to be able to change behavior. Um, it's not just creating algorithms or deploying algorithms or making algorithms available. It's actually put the, putting them into practice and, and changing, uh, changing the behavior of an organization. And the problem you're running into is you have to deal with people. <laughs> if we didn't have to deal with people, we'd be much better off. Um, but uh, it's the change management um, that, that really becomes the most difficult, the, the resistance that we all naturally have, whether you're in an organization or not. Nobody likes to have to change, but we have to. That's the reality of where we are. So t my advice would be to understand that doing the analytics, deploying the solution is part of the challenge. The other part of the challenge is seeing it through to completion and actually seeing the changed behavior and the changed outcomes. That's where it gets very creative and innovative in how, how you get people to change. Well, uh, and along those lines, you really can't care who gets the credit. There's, there's an amazing piece in the, in the movie Moneyball where our hero, Brad Pitt, and, and our data scientist, uh, Jonah Hill. Jonah Hill are, are getting uh, pushback and basic blocked by Art Howe, who was the manager, right. right? And Art Howe owned the lineup card, and he wouldn't play the guys that, that the data scientists wanted them to play in order to achieve the goals. And so they had to work their way around him, but in the end, it worked, and, and the A's won their division. They won. They actually set the record for the longest win streak in Major League Baseball. But at the end, what you hear is the announcers on TV and everybody saying, what a great job Art Howe did with this group of misfits. It's true. So even though he was the roadblock, he got all the credit for the success. And, and you know, the, the owner and, and the data scientists, they didn't care, right? because they were successful and they right. changed the culture of the organization. Right, they were successful by causing the change, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, okay, do you work with other IT relationship management teams to support the business or are you providing the data science service largely independently? Oh God, no, it's, this is a, the way we're set up is, is, crafts could be a little bit different than other organizations. Um, we have a CIO because uh, of a large, uh, technology infrastructure, of course, uh, mm -hmm. given the size of our organization. We've also split the roles between a chief data officer and a chief analytics officer role. Mm -hmm. I have the chief analytics officer role, which is very different than the chief data officer role. Um, he is, it's a he, he's very much focused on uh, the, the tasks I, I referenced earlier, the data engineering and, and the data governance. Um, now, there are many organizations that will integrate the two. Um, in the financial services sector, because of the regulatory changes after the uh, Great Recession in 2008, 2009, uh, many financial services organizations created chief data officers. Mm -hmm. um, and then, of course, the senior leaders uh, learned that we're collecting vast amounts of data for the regulators. Maybe we can get some business value out of this as well. 
So, so many of those teams added the analytics capabilities to them. So it's going to differ um, a little bit across organizations, but really those three functional areas, infrastructure, data, and analytics, have to be integrated in some form or fashion. Mm -hmm. um, and, and we do it by working together as, as peers. Okay, thank you. Um, have you noticed any connection between the growth of IoT and the demand for data science? In other words, is the volume of data from IoT driving the demand? I would say definitely. Yeah. Um, you must be seeing I mean, a lot of those applications. Yeah. 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 I mean, that's what the IoT, the Internet of Things, is what's really driving the collection and access to so much more data than we've ever had before. So I think they're directly correlated. Did you have something you want to add? To well, that? we had a, a great example with Watson. Um, there's a bike race, a bicycle race every year that starts in Long Beach, California and goes to Manhattan Beach in, in New York. And we instrumented one of the bikes and one of the riders and, and he's actually, he owned a bike shop. He wasn't a professional cyclist. Everyone else in this race is a professional cyclist. Uh, but he was in great shape. He was 45 year old guy, everybody else in their 20s. Uh, and we instrumented him with the Internet of Things Watson, collecting just tons of data. And based on Watson, we were telling him, you know, when he needed to rest, when his performance was declining, when he had to go for it. And, and he actually took second in the race. And it was because of the data science and the Internet of Things and the amount of data that we collected that drove him and, and helped him achieve his goal of actually, his goal was to finish, mm -hmm. but he actually took second, which was... Amazing. So just think of what it can do for an organization. Exactly. Right? <laughs> okay, thank you. Uh, next question, probably triggered by something you said, James, um, in describing the, um, uh, the commonality between the professions. Um, this question is, um, uh, so certain badges earned can be applied to multiple professional certifications, e.g. a core skill badge can be applied to data scientist and enterprise architect, or not quite? No. <laughs> um, we did look very hard at that question. Um, yeah, it would be really nice if we could have the badges that were the same. But um, the conclusion was that the experience demonstrating the skills and the requirements to achieve a badge in one profession need to be from the practice of that profession. Um, so, for example, if you look at the professional communications badge, yeah, the requirements are the same but it must be in the exercise of your profession as a data scientist or as a technical specialist or as an architect uh, because we feel the nature of those communications are different. Um, so just because you can talk very lucidly about, um, I don't know, data engineering or, or um, configuring uh, um, SAP to do a particular role doesn't mean you can communicate well as a data scientist. So we have kept them distinct. Um, I think the chances are that should you apply for uh, a badge in another profession, it's not going to be difficult to achieve if you're now working in that new profession. So um, we don't think it's a, 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 that, that decision is a, is a practical barrier of any way. We think it actually reflects correctly the way in which professionals operate and think and behave in, the, in, their, in, their, in their working lives. Okay, thank you. Um, Maureen, you talked about certain universities being, and in fact, Martin did as well, uh, certain universities being um, uh, offering courses now, and that's that's one way, uh, one um, channel for recruitment. Um, in terms of outreach for this program now, kind of advice to the open group and the members, you know, where where might be the obvious targets to um, focus for this for this program? I mean, universities might be one. Clearly, we want other open group members to get to get involved. Are there are they are there any other things, any other targets we should be thinking about that you? Think well, might I, be rich. I think uh, any enterprise, uh, maybe some that are not open group members yet, right. but could really value from that, um, obviously would be welcomed uh, with open arms to mm -hmm. join, uh, you know, join the open group and be able to advance the profession. So universities is certainly a key part. Other enterprises across industry, by the way, I mean, we see a, a lot of interest from certain industries in data science, but the value really can be driven in any industry and, and organization. So we would be looking at that as well. 
We, we've got a, a brand new forum in the open group, the uh, Open Subsurface Data Universe Forum, which mm -hmm. is basically about um, creating a cloud-based platform for analyzing the data that the oil and gas operators are getting from exploration. And um, they have a very keen interest in data science, and this this mm -hmm. is going to be of great interest to them, I think. So yes. it's just picking one industry, or well, two industries, I guess. You know, it's a great so. Internet of Things application for, uh -huh. for <laughs> oil, and, uh, oil and gas exploration and production. Yeah. 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 And I would think you would want government agencies oh, yeah. to, to be participating mm -hmm. uh, in public policy and, and deciding, you know, census there's <laughs> a lot of data right mm -hmm. right yeah yeah Absolutely. no that's right yeah and and you know it's when, when as with all these uh, certification programs that we run when when customers are asking for it that's when there's a lot of interest and that's the the kind of the pull through for people to uh, take it seriously and maybe get accredited so okay um a response to the answer you just gave by the look of it. Um, could you wear multiple roles, role hats within a single project? Hmm. Maybe that's not a... I'm sure you, I'm sure you could. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, the, 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 we, for, from the perspective of a certification program, we're looking, we're looking at um, you know, evidence and, and of, of achievement of the, of the requirements. Um, and if you're, you know, been working within a project and have multiple hats in it, there's there's no reason why you couldn't be simultaneously qualifying for two different things. I don't know. That's that's a, could be quite fun to do, um, but I see no reason why not. There's no, I don't see any particular mm -hmm. obstacle. Right. right. You right. just got to. You just have to convince the professionals who are your peer reviewers at the end of the process that you've actually done the stuff as an architect, as a data scientist, as a as a technical specialist. Um, so, you know, the interview process is non-trivial, but if you've, if you've been doing it, then making the case isn't going to be a problem. Mm -hmm. Okay, two more questions. So, last chance, and if, you, if you have one. Um, two more to come. Um, and this is about the, uh, the, the community aspect. So, uh, again, another, another plug for the... I'm looking that way, the slide's <laughs> obviously not there. But another plug for the workshop tomorrow um, as, as the start of this. I mean, we're, we're looking now at this point, we have something to build on, something to discuss. Um, how do we evolve the profession? Um, you know, how do we over time evolve the certification program as we learn more? Um, so, um, you know, the, the question is how do we how do we get involved? Was the question, but uh, I guess that's as much a open group question as anything else. But you know, the the answer is please do get involved. I mean, the workshop is there is there tomorrow, and then look out for more things that that we might be uh, that we might be offering in that in that space. Um, anything to add to that? I mean, don't want to steal your question, but no, that's about I mean, it. We, yeah. we welcome the involvement. We really hope we get a good turnout tomorrow. Um, but it's going to go beyond, well beyond tomorrow and the workshop. So, mm -hmm. you know, we, we have a, a group that is, is going. I would say, you know, reach out to any of us in terms of wanting to really get more involved. And, um, and we will definitely engage. Perfect. Okay. Final question then before we go into the break. Save this one to last because it seemed appropriate. How many data scientists does it take to screw in a light bulb? <laughs> <laughs> we don't have any hardware guys. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds like a joke. I don't know if anyone has a better, uh, you know, an amusing answer, but... Uh, it's an architect problem. Right? Yeah, it's an architect's <laughs> problem. It's a good answer. <laughs> yeah, one fewer than it would take architects is another answer. Yeah, okay. Okay. Okay, well, we'll, we'll wrap it up there. Thank you all um, for participating, for your insights, and for taking the questions. And thank you all for uh, a considerable set of questions and, and your interest. And if you have further interest, then uh, tomorrow is the uh, time to go to the workshop.